Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Seven weeks. Decker, are you okay? It's going to kill me. It's going to kill me. What? What's going to kill you? The suck! Oh no, you are not doing that to me again. Not after last summer. Come on, come with me. Now, sit here and vent, okay? No, no, wait! No, no, I want out! I don't want to do the summer of Steven Seagal! I figured it out already. There's nothing more to say. Seagal plays Seagal. In movies produced by Seagal, directed by Seagal, or written by Seagal, everything in the summer of Seagal is dripping with Seagal! Oh, stop complaining. You're starting to sound like rat trap. Here, why don't you review this? Black Dawn. Uh, directed by Alexander Grzynski and written by Martin Wheeler, Black Dawn stars Seagal as Jonathan Cole, a super agent with a mysterious past who happens to be the best in the world. Also, while the entire movie was filmed in a 30-day period, Seagal himself was only on set for 18 days. 18? That's 40% less Seagal! It's Seagal Light! It's Diane Seagal! It's... You're welcome. Alright, let's take a look at Black Dawn and see... Hey, wait a minute. Did you just trick me into doing this for another week? Yep. Damn it! Well, we opened the credits that looked like they were thrown together in Power Director. I should know, it's what I use. And characters that looked like they were thrown together in an afternoon as they give the opening lines over and over again. Spare no one. Before we die, slaves. Spare no one. You love. You love. Spare no one. Before we die, slaves. Spare no one. You love. You love. Spare no one. Before we die, slaves. We get it. It's not that interesting. What the fuck are you doing? Anyway, the credits take place during a meeting between Nikolai and his terrorist boss, who is shot in the face, a uh, uh, chest, but for some reason, Nikolai is not killed. Because otherwise, this movie would be too short. Instead, we see him and an accomplice in Amsterdam as they move in to stealthily and secretly murder armored transport guards in broad daylight. I know he probably hasn't had much practice with that, I mean, Dutch security aren't even allowed guns in real life, but how the fuck does he keep missing a slow-moving target with no cover using an automatic weapon? They blow up a car for no apparent reason, as they easily escape while the guard continues to fire and is so ineffective even the pedestrians don't care. Suddenly we're teleported to Utah as we meet up with a different group of criminals, which just so happens to include Steven Seagal, or as he is depicted in this scenario, Dr. Steven Seagal, coming into a correctional facility to give a random injection to one of the inmates. You are dead! You are fucking dead! I'd love to know what it was he was supposedly doing there, but, well, it's, um, never explained in the slightest. Whatever it was, evidently it wasn't supposed to be a lethal injection, as the sudden spike in the man's blood pressure causes Dr. Seagal to make the command decision that the patient must be moved to a proper hospital to deal with this, despite the fact that with a blood pressure of 240, he likely wouldn't survive the next five minutes. Never mind that, though, they take the convenient ambulance, revealing that this was all part of the elaborate breakout! Been away so long, it even feels good to be stuck in LA traffic. So! Care to explain how you kept him alive during that 400-mile drive, or why you didn't just use a slightly less elaborate jailbreak that did not risk having his heart explode outside his chest? What the fuck was in the syringe? Anything, man! It was worth the trouble. Of course not! Do you know what a little fat boy is? Well, little boy was a bomb dropped on Hiroshima, and fat man was the one dropped later on Nagasaki. And a little fat boy is something you find at McDonald's. Seriously, no atomic bombs were ever named that. But of course he's talking about nuclear weapons, as he's impressed with Seagal's resume, which includes nuclear weapon intelligence. As he's an arms dealer, this is useful to him. They return to his headquarters, where they meet... Wait a minute. Jesus Christ. No, actually, that's John Piper Ferguson playing the role of James Donovan. 
Strangely enough, he's actually never played Jesus. This also introduces us to Tamara Davies as Amanda Stewart, a government agent, and Don Franklin as Max Pearson, her partner. It turns out that Jonathan Cold was her mentor at some point, but in the past, he killed six agents and vanished. This is illustrated for us in a flashback scene that isn't remotely explained. Now he's classified as a foreigner. I'd think his birthplace would matter a little bit more there than his actions, but I'll take your word for it. Furthermore, evidently their xenophobic agency has a policy to kill on site any and all foreign operatives. But first better call this into her boss, Greer, played by Timothy Carhart. Jonathan Cold. Cold? Mm-hmm. Are you sure Intel says he died last year in Prague? So by vanished they meant killed. Well, they should have known better than that. Seagal can't die. Be careful. Dead or alive, Cold is a dangerous man. Uh, mind explaining to us how exactly he would be dangerous while dead? Look out, though. Those European terrorists hitched a ride to L.A. And slipped through security easily enough while the TSA agents were busy strip-searching the elderly and threatening unruly five-year-olds. They visit a jewelry store, easily taking out the inept armed guards and forcing the manager to open the comically oversized safe at gunpoint, allowing them to steal a few small trays worth of diamonds, and that's it. I know that's probably several million dollars worth of rocks there, but there are plenty of other valuables in that safe and more than enough room left in that backpack. And plenty of jewelry on display. No police are coming anyway, you have plenty of time. Back with Black Market Family Outlet, a division of Gramco, we learn they intend to deal with nuclear weaponry, which Seagal is kind enough to point out the obvious that they need weapons-grade plutonium to have said weapon useful. Okay, uh, where the fuck are they planning on getting weapons-grade plutonium? What is a common criminal like James doing hanging out with a Russian nuclear physicist like Mishkin? Oh, I guess that works. Okay, let's just say, for argument's sake, that they're trying to build a nuke. The fuck? Did you read ahead in the script? Where would they get the plutonium? From hip. There are two power stations in Oakland and a test facility in Pasadena. Yeah, those all could work, but I thought you wanted weapons-grade plutonium. The best those can provide is reactor-grade. Weapons-grade isn't even available in California. They figure, though, since the test lab in Pasadena is a civilian facility with less security, that must be where the most dangerous shit is kept, and therefore, where they should check first. I don't know, maybe it's Pasadena, Texas. I mean, that is the wrong city in Texas to get weapons-grade plutonium, but at least it's the right state. Oh, wait, now this movie's from 2005. They, they moved it to Nevada. Can't beat this Southern California weather, can you, Mr. McCabe? Better than Los Alamos. <laughs> oh, never mind all of that. No matter what, they got it wrong. Whoa, hold on. We're back at the black convenience store where Amanda secretly photographed Seagal while still remaining completely obvious. What was wrong with the window she used three times before? Seagal is interrupted by Jesus as it's time to make the first deal, the handy nuclear device that fits easily in a briefcase. I'd love to talk about the merits of that in reality, but I've already googled weapons-grade plutonium and where to find it. There's a good chance that I'm on the FBI watch list now. Let's not push it any further. A child can carry this. Oh, yeah, I'll google that too, if I want a SWAT team to show up later today. Everything checks out, except they lack a password. He says he left it in his car, so they follow him out there to learn he really did leave it in his car. Hmm. What? Damn. Jesus is an asshole. If these are the wrong numbers, it would be interesting to see what your next trick is. Mm, probably hiring a hacker or something? You know, cracking passcodes is kind of their thing. Continuing on this incredibly interesting story about thugs going shopping, the group of terrorists... Hey, a uh, quick question. Uh, how exactly are they terrorists? I mean, yeah, they kill people and want to nuke, but... What's their goal? This might surprise you, but terrorists usually kill people for a reason. Anyway, Jesus brings in their customers who pay with an incredibly small amount of diamonds, but promise them the rest are in a safe deposit box and they'll get the key after they get the device and plutonium. I'm not sure what good a key will do them when they still won't be able to access it without a matching ID and signature. <laughs> Never mind those pesky details, though. First, we've got to teleport back to the warehouse with Amanda's partner to find out there is more in it than just a bunch of naked female mannequins. Uh, might have been a better idea to find out who that was before you, uh, killed him. 
Actually, though, he was right to shoot, as it turns out these agents were sent by someone who was trying to kill him and his partner for some reason. Where is she? <laughs> Across the street. She's the one making all the noise with the gigantic camera. Seriously, you didn't notice her on the way in? Because the bad guys sure did. As in the other bad guys from earlier. No, not the terrorists, the other. Uh, you know, it's really not looking very good for you when 85% of the characters in this movie are criminals. They bring her in during the deal because while it might have been much easier to just shoot her outside or smarter to hold her for questioning sometime later, that wouldn't have given Seagal the opportunity to save her stupid ass and cause the deaths of several miscellaneous bad guys in the ensuing chaos. They're not the only ones to make bad decisions though, as when the two escape into the dump truck passing by and their driver is shot but not killed, he decides the best course of action is to just keep driving as long as he can, needlessly endangering his life and the lives of those around him. You know, it's uh, pretty bad when your chase scene looks less realistic than Ridge Racer. He's not alone in placing oneself in unnecessary danger, as the two of them lean over the top to shoot at their pursuers, despite the fact that if they stay down, they'll be completely fine. Cover doesn't matter to Seagal, though, as even though he's ten feet in front of his pursuers and completely out in the open, they still can't manage to shoot him, and the chase scene goes on for a while after this. They drop their payload, which does not break off right away for some reason, but don't worry, these are the extra stupid bad guys who will drive right into it anyway, leading to Seagal driving right into them, pushing them all into an explosive death. Enjoy the ride. No, he didn't die, or get injured. And this surprise is no one. Now that they're alone, she grills Seagal for working with bad guy groups A and B when he's supposed to be with good guys. You disappeared for six years. Six? Didn't your boss just say he died last year? Where the fuck did the six years come from? They need to escape, so she picks the lock on a car door, but silly woman trying to hotwire it, Seagal found the key. Which means whoever owned the car locked their keys inside it. She intends to go back to the warehouse where her partner is, where luckily enough, time has stopped, and the bad guy agents are still questioning him. And they couldn't have gotten this detail out of the way before the car chase? Maybe that's because they wanted to keep it relevant when they found the body. Can't let our target audience's short attention span spoil this amazing plot now, can we? On that note, who should walk in but her boss, Greer? What happened here? Why don't you tell us? No, don't do it! What's he doing here? Well, Seagal's character was in the scenes leading up to this. You're the one that got teleported into the middle of the movie, seemingly at random. After finding out they know fuck all, he tells Stuart that evidently, someone is after her, and it's best if she comes with him for safety. You're gonna trust him? Let's see, if there's a rogue faction in the agency, then it's probably someone she knows. Which narrows it down to Greer... or Greer. Fucking A, did they forget to provide a red herring again? No time to explain the obvious, as they must run from another random encounter, which doesn't do much in terms of explaining things or even that much for excitement, but it succeeds in getting Seagal and Stewart separated. Bad guy Group B is getting impatient with Jesus over the plutonium, but he assures them that it's on its way. I almost forgot. Again. Okay. Yep, not exactly a mystery where he's keeping it. It turns out he's secretly working with Greer, uh, I mean Obscured Reflection Mystery Man. Plus, he was smuggling plutonium in his coffee mug! Good thing he's got those lead-lined gloves. Wouldn't want to get cancer while handling that plutonium, as he smokes two packs of cigarettes in the last five minutes. While the agenda-free terrorists start building their bomb without plutonium, Jesus decides he's already tired of all this bullshit. Fuck them. Once we get the key, we waste them. Yeah. I'm curious as to exactly how the hell he managed to stay in business as an arms dealer. It's kind of hard to have satisfied customers when they're all dead. 
As Seagal has next to nothing to contribute to the movie for a while, he stops by a local hacker's home who he evidently knew at some point, and requests information before we suddenly shift to the deal continuing, but unfortunately for our nuclear smoker, Stuart happens to show up. Oh, she was following him for the last three scenes. For some reason, she didn't seem all that interested in stopping him all those other times he sat down. A fight ensues as he is less than willing to let her know where the plutonium is, but suddenly... What? Uh, no, seriously, let's look at that again. The gun is plainly visible! Pointing sideways at the bed! How do you fuck something up that bad? You could have just cut away to nothing and it would have been better! Now she realizes that she has no idea where the plutonium is and proceeds to tear apart the apartment, but look out! Jesus and his merry band of terrorists have come to town. Oh, excuse me, the, uh, the elevator's broken. Eh? May I ask you found? Thank you. <gasps> Such evil! Can no one put an end to these bloodthirsty miscreants? Right on cue, she figures out the plutonium is in the secret compartment under the medicine cabinet. But oh no, she hears them coming up the stairs! So instead of finding an alternate escape route, she breaks into someone else's apartment where... Hmm. Oh, don't mind me. Please, continue. Strangely enough, they don't appreciate this interruption. This attracts Jesus and friends, leading to a standoff where three of his men are killed. However... Stupid bitch. Ooh, silly female characters and their inability to stay conscious after being lightly pushed aside. Seagal is back in this movie, though, and his presence evidently causes several civilians to decide to have a random firefight, but no bother, Seagal finishes them off. Where's my key? Where am I going? Some country bank, San Diego. Okay, now it's time to kill him. No, it's not time for Seagal's double to beat up some goons. You said after you get the key, you kill him, so... Or you can forget about that and just take out the housekeeping trolley. Nikolai and Stasi escape with the plutonium right before the police arrive, and, well, no reason to stop or question them. We've got to see the last remaining Terror Twins preparing the bomb. We did it. Moments we will be heroes. Yay, heroes! To who? What the fuck are you fighting for? You never explained that part. <gasps> and you never will. Fucking a. This reveals that it turns out Greer was behind this all along. Who do you think could pull off a job like this? Not you. Not Aslan. Me. Okay, what's your motive? <laughs> I guess that wasn't important either. <laughs> God fucking damn it! Now that the bomb is set, they rush to the rooftop and take the convenient helicopter and have a brief chat, somehow taking less than a minute. But lifting off and moving about 50 feet takes more than a minute, so they better hurry up and transform into terrible CGI before it's too late. The fallout from that nuke will render the city uninhabitable for quite some time, and the EMP blast from that nuke will fry your chopper's circuit, sending you crashing down to your death. But no, of course they live, and no bad comes from this explosion, as we find they are doing quite well, as... Normally when people sleep together, they have no, a what, what are you... The fuck? You know, I don't recall there just being three nights. Oh, whatever. Ew! Okay, horror movie ending, apparently, as Stuart and Seagal have been fucking like maniacs since becoming irradiated, likely producing mutant offspring to destroy the world. Terrible creatures immune to bullets, explosions, and radiation. And that's just the traits they inherited from their father. Well, that was Black Dawn. What the fuck was the point? Honestly, if you can get past Seagal being poorly spliced into every action sequence he's in, as truth be told he's not actually in any of them, the story seems like it's going to come off at least average. The action isn't too bad, and the acting decent, but there are serious problems that crop up nonetheless. The pacing is questionable at best. 
I don't know if they really thought the plutonium in the coffee mug would be an interesting reveal, but considering he's the only character with access to plutonium and they focus so heavily on the mug, it's more than a little obvious. Also, I know the flow of a movie matters when depicting character knowledge versus chronological events, but the fact that a character's death was delayed for ten minutes when logically only two seconds had passed, it's hard to see that as anything but scrambled editing. Seagal doesn't help much either. I mean, we didn't expect him to, but despite him being on set for just over half the shooting days, he's still in most of the movie, or at least his body double is. The thing is, instead of getting half off Seagal, we got half assed Seagal, which is something like eighth assed acting for 90% of the movie. However, the biggest flaw in this film has to be the simplest and hardest to understand how they let happen. The villains simply have no motivation. Oh, the gun smugglers do. Money. That works. But the terrorists? They have no agenda. At best, they're seeking revenge for their fallen leader. But still, before that, they had no agenda. And besides, they were just puppets for Greer, who again, has no fucking agenda. People who are about to nuke a city and kill millions of men, women, and children usually have a reason or two to do it, especially when they fully intend to take themselves out in the blast as well. At the end of the day, Black Dawn tries really hard to be your average action romp, but despite having decent actors for the most part and not bad fight scenes, Seagal's presence actively works to devalue every scene he's in, and the lack of any real motive makes the whole movie simply feel pointless, despite its few entertaining qualities, coming in at two whatevers out of five. Not to mention the fact that none of the characters could agree whether Seagal was missing or dead for one, two, or six years. Why not just say three? That's how long it's been since the last movie. Yeah, that's right. I mean... Wait. This was a sequel? Yep. Don't worry, though. You can review the original next week. Joy. Thank you all for watching. I have been Decker Shadow, and remember, I'm going to have to watch more Seagal.